Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our presentation today, hosted by the University of Hawaii on the research project titled Envisioning in Situ or In Place, Sea Level Rise Adaptation Strategies for a Densely Developed Coastal Community, Waikiki. I'm Wendy Migoro. Before I introduce the team, a little housekeeping. The slides and the recording from today will be available on the project website. Also, this webinar is approved for one AIA continuing education credit through the Google link form in the chat. Throughout the presentation, we welcome your questions. Please go ahead and type them into the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll address as many as possible in the discussion portion and also through written responses. If you'd like to share a comment with the entire audience, please use the chat function in Zoom. Now onto the presentation. Next slide, please. Our team is hosted, or today's presentation is hosted by an interdisciplinary team from the School of Architecture, Hawaii Sea Grant, and the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. The University of Hawaii um, is sponsoring this research through Hawaii Sea Grant. The research is directed by myself, uh, Wendy Migoro, and Interim Dean Chip Fletcher. The renderings are by architecture graduate research assistants, Jojo Briones and Ireland Castillo. And the outreach is organized by Hawaii Sea Grant's Eileen Pippard and Melanie Lander. Next slide, please. We would also like to thank collaborators, Dolan Eversole, Chris Lomboy, and Andrew Tang. Next slide. And our panelists for today are uh, Lisa Rapp, who is an architect with the focus on hospitality and high-rise projects and is a principal at AHL. Randall Wakamoto is an engineer who serves as a program administrator for the city's Department of Facility Maintenance Stormwater Quality Division. Uh, we will be pausing the presentations to survey you for your opinion on adaptation strategies that are described. Participation in the survey is voluntary. If you have any concerns or questions, please contact us. An email address will be uh, pasted in the chat. First, I'll give a little background on this research project. One approach to manage sea level rise in densely urban Waikiki is to assume an in-place adaptation strategy. This has yet to be defined and envisioned. We are working on this research project to create conceptual design renderings and a written design brief to help visualize preliminary flood adaptation strategies in Waikiki while educating the next generation of designers. Next slide, please. This public presentation marks a milestone after two years of research described here. First, faculty and students conducted background research, learning from emerging flood resilience guides, case studies, and the latest sea level rise science from UH SOS. Next, we identified the flood adaptation strategies that seemed relevant for Waikiki and solicited feedback on them from over 70 stakeholders. Third, students created site-specific urban and architectural renderings of a resilient, economically vibrant Waikiki with flood adaptation strategies, which we will share today. The goal is for these renderings to compel discussion, contribute to design guides, pilot projects, and new policies that prepare for future flooding. Today, we will present strategies for one site, survey the audience, and discuss with panelists, then repeat the process for the second site. I'll hand it over to Eileen to play the first presentation and polls. Okay, so the first one is Jojo Briones. We began our design process by first identifying the local mean sea level rise scenarios for Honolulu in the years 2050 and 2100. We referenced the NOAA scenarios that project decadal amounts of sea level rise for either low, intermediate low, intermediate, intermediate high, and high scenarios. The NOAA scenarios are used in planning approaches that account for buildings risk tolerance. This graph shows the newly released 2022 interagency sea level rise scenarios calculated for the Honolulu Tide Station. The renderings we'll share today were developed prior to the publication of these 2022 scenarios. Our team used the 2017 NOAA report, which shows slightly more sea level rise than the 2022 report. 
we've selected the intermediate high scenario, which projects approximately two feet, one foot and two inches of local mean sea level by 2050 and five feet and 10 inches of local mean sea level by 2100. We opted to use the NOAA intermediate high scenario due to the low tolerance of risk for the types of residential buildings that we looked at for this project. Using the NOAA sea level rise viewer, we referenced these maps, which show the scale of potential flooding expected in Waikiki for passive flooding. We use these maps to understand where flooding is projected to occur. The NOAA sea level rise viewer uses one foot increments of sea level rise, here showing two feet of sea level rise where there's limited flooded areas and increased flooded areas with three feet of sea level rise, four feet of sea level rise, five feet of sea level rise, and at six feet, we see widespread flooding over most of Waikiki. Next, we'll dive into the site selection process and criteria. First, we identified which areas were flooded soonest using the PACT I use sea level rise exposure area or SLOREXA at 3.2 feet. And in order to represent multiple types of buildings, we identified sites with high rise and low rise residential, commercial, retail, and hospitality. We sought properties with at grade or below grade spaces that appeared vulnerable to flooding. And we selected older buildings that we speculated having the potential for future redevelopment. Today we'll present sites number one and two shown on this map. Other sites that we identified for potential future research are also shown. First, we'll discuss a high rise residential building with below grade parking located on the Malka side of Waikiki on Alawai Boulevard in a FEMA zone AO. The team estimated water levels and designed guidelines overlaid on this diagrammatic section drawing at the site. This image shows local mean sea level and mean higher high water. The present day FEMA based flood elevation or BFE shown here in orange represents the level of water expected during the calculated 1% annual chance flood event. The BFE is represented or is referenced to determine how high structures need to be elevated in order to meet flood insurance or code requirements. Based on the NOAA intermediate high scenario for local mean sea level, by 2050, we're designing for two feet of permanent inundation relative to current mean higher high water levels. In addition, an eight inch king tide event 2050 would temporarily increase the water levels. Next, we proposed a set of sea level rise adjusted base flood elevations and design flood elevations. The proposed sea level rise base flood elevations in 2050, as shown in orange, is measured from the estimated water levels, including sea level rise and king tide. To reiterate, this accounts for a 1% annual chance flood in 2050. The design flood elevation is determined by adding additional height called freeboard to the base flood elevation. This design flood elevation is a required elevation of the first floor and its supporting beams. And in 2050, we propose an additional one foot of freeboard if this building is renovated. In 2100, the NOAA intermediate scenario shows six feet and eight inches of permanent inundation from sea level rise. And in addition, 10 inches of temporary inundation from king tide is anticipated. Similar to 2050, two feet is added for an adjusted base flood elevation in 2100, and another one foot is added for the freeboard for the design flood elevation in 2100. In the following renders, the first floors are elevated above the sea level rise adjusted design flood elevation to show different adaptation strategies by 2050 and 2100. So starting off with the present day conditions, this render section perspective represents this location as it is currently today. To start off on the right, the white dashed lines show the current mean higher high water and future sea level rise scenarios laid out across the site. And on the left, the white dashed lines represent the current BFE and DFE, as well as the proposed future BFE and DFE with sea level rise plus a king tide. Currently, the all white boulevard Currently, Alawai Boulevard has three lanes of traffic with a shared bike lane, parking, sidewalk, and vegetated buffers. The below grade parking is below the current FEMA base flood elevation with more parking and residential tower above. 
The team considered the projected water levels as well as feedback from the stakeholder workshop when evaluating flood adaptation strategies for the site. At the projected scenario of two feet of sea level rise plus an eight inch of king tide, the existing street and the below grade parking would be flooded. Building adaptations include filling the below grade space to the nearest adjacent grade in 2050. This is consistent with Boston guidelines, this diagram showing a darker pink area that was filled to the nearest adjacent grade for a space below the design flood elevation. To better connect the existing building structure to the sidewalk below, a new pedestrian ramp is proposed. A local example is similar to the exterior stairs and ramps at Kaka'ako at Whole Foods Market. If there were any building systems within the proposed below grade space, all would be relocated above the DFE, similar to this elevated platform in Kaka'ako. The building would also include new cisterns to collect rainwater since storm drain backflow and higher water tables may limit drainage and infiltration. An example is shown here in this image and schematic drawing. Moving to the site strategies for transportation and open space, the street would be raised two feet and one inch from the top of the existing street. The street elevation was determined by estimating the water table height and the depth of the subgrade and asphalt and will be explained further in the following presentation of site two. The top of the 2050 street would be located five feet, two inches above local mean sea level in 2021. In addition, a new proposed two-way bike lane and extension of the pedestrian zone on the canal side would enhance recreational opportunities and follow principles from the Complete Streets Guide from Honolulu. Other site strategies such as vaulted utilities could be located above two feet, the two feet of sea level rise waterline and beneath the new raised sidewalks. Above the new fill that was previously parking, water cisterns can be added to store water from heavy rainfall events and to detain and filter stormwater on site, biofiltration would be applied throughout, such as rain gardens, bioswales, and green roofs. Tree canopies could also provide shade for pedestrians and bicyclists. Here are two examples of bioswales taken from the Honolulu Complete Streets Guide. All these strategies make up the proposed 2050 retrofits with a 2100 scenario to follow next. But before we move on, we'll take a couple of moments and pause the presentation to hear your feedback on the 2050 adaptation strategies that you've just seen. Mahalo. Thanks for your feedback. Now we'll continue with the adaptation strategies for the scenario of six feet, eight inches of sea level rise plus a 10 inch king tide. Starting off on the building side, the previous first floor would be repurposed. This new space would be built out in order to create a potential commercial slash public space on the new first floor. Because of the high ceilings and the previous conditions, the floor could be raised to the new DFE for the sea level rise plus a king tide projection. The new raised floor connects the elevated exterior circulation to accommodate the grade change from the street level to the building level. And the critical systems that were on the first floor in the 2050 scenario would be raised to the second floor in the 2100 scenario. Similarly, the rainwater catchment for the building would be elevated above the DFE. For the site strategies, the top of the new street would be raised four feet, 11 inches. And this new street would be located seven feet above the local mean sea level in 2021. And under the new raised sidewalks, the voltage utilities would need to be raised as well as they were for the 2050 scenario. As the first floor, as the first floor is elevated up to the DFE, the water cisterns raised are raised above the estimated water table and temporarily store rainwater during heavy rainfall events. At this point, the tree canopy would be more developed, providing increased shade for pedestrian areas vegetated buffers and a new green roof above the built out first floor would provide biofiltration. Collectively, these strategies make up the 2100 retrofit concluding the adaptation strategies for the Malka Waikiki site. 
Next, we'll pause the presentation again to hear your feedback on these 2100 adaptations, then move on to the next site. Mahalo. Um, now I'd like to welcome to the stage the, um, the panelists, Lisa Rapp and Randall Wakamoto. Um, we wanted to invite them because we wanted to have both uh, perspectives from architect and engineer. We've um, crafted a few um, questions. So the first one, um, we have about 10 minutes for a discussion on the first site. Um, and we will both ask a couple of questions from the research team and then take questions from the audience. Um, and this first question is directed to Lisa. Um, and then we'll welcome Randall's comments as well. Um, so based on the proposed fire, uh, future higher design flood elevations, we have proposed commercial areas on the new um, ground floor for a lively pedestrian experience. And how do you think that transition between the lower street and the higher building interior can be designed to be appealing to the building owner as well as to the public? Okay, well, um, thank you, Wendy, for the question. Uh, yes, I think um, really the goal should be in those public spaces where we have those uh, level changes is to make them as activated and user-friendly as possible and really appealing. And the way you can do that, and uh, there are some examples already at Kaka'ako, some good examples. And yeah, thank you for showing that Whole Foods, that's uh, one of our projects, but it, it shows sort of not just steps and ramps, but also if you're introducing things like benches and parklets, you know, kind of green the space, um, provide vegetation and trees, uh, that really helps. And um, introducing those will add some visual impact and interest and um, allow people to navigate. And I think it will be more inviting for people. So that really should be the goal is to really activate that, that landscape and, and make it more inviting. And Randall, any thoughts on that streetscape experience? Well, just, just, just add that, you know, I really like the idea of what Lisa just mentioned and also just adding in that considerations for making sure that it's accessible and for all users. Uh, so this is not just for pedestrians, but for those that might have difficulties accessing, um, you know, just making sure that it's accessible to all users and then making that experience much more um, inviting and friendly, like she mentioned. Agreed. I'll open up to Jojo. Okay, so the next question that we wanted to ask, um, we're gonna direct this one at Randall this time, but then welcome comments from Lisa. Um, so we wanted to ask that, um, would the below grade spaces or the below grade water storage and the vaulted utilities, would they need to be raised above the water table, Randall? Uh, thank you for that question. And from my perspective, you know, in terms of um, under our Department of Facility Maintenance, we are responding to a lot of those emergencies and situations where having to deal with utilities, um, particularly with the storm drainage system. And, you know, for all the utilities, I would, I would suspect and probably um, mention that, you know, if it is in a submerged condition, then it basically makes it impossible to maintain. Um, so it obviously would need to be above the, um, the water table. Uh, just to avoid any of those situations where it could be submerged or even ha either having to repair or replace. Um, I know that the Board of Water Supply, that's one of their major issues when having to deal with water main breaks um, or having to replace a, an existing pipe that's you know, submerged, in which case it basically makes it um, practically impossible for them to do it, in which case they have to do some major construction to either um, shore the site to dewater it and being able to have proper access. And, you know, that just makes it very difficult, very costly, and, you know, it just delays the, um, the ability to respond to those kind of emergency or, um, you know, scheduled uh, maintenance operations. Uh, I would also just mention that, I guess, 
taking into consideration the location. I, I definitely like the idea of utility vaults. I like the idea that you know they're um, placed in areas where it could be contained and being able to make it accessible. Uh, but I would also mention that uh, taking into account the type of utilities and what the operations is that's gonna be responding. So in most cases, like whether it's your major utilities, like your water, um, sewer, storm drainage, you know, it does involve a lot of heavy type of equipment. And by placing it in the areas that's more near like a sidewalk or like a pedestrian or a bike path, in a lot of cases, typically they're not designed to handle the heavy wheel loads for heavy equipment. Um, so, you know, those are, you know, part of the concerns is having to also think about who's going to be responding and the type of equipment that's used to repair and replace those type of utilities. And that's why typically you see those that's within the roadways because it can actually support that type of heavy loads. Thank you, Randall. Yeah, these are definitely things that uh, go beyond the design and things that you want to think about afterwards. So thank you. And one question that we have for the both of you, and maybe we can start off with Lisa, is regarding the flood adaptation strategies that we've shown, what do you think should be done first? Um, thinking about what is most necessary versus something that's nice to have. And maybe again, we can start with Lisa. Wow, um, there's a lot of things that are really important. It's always hard to think of what should go first, but I think really just thinking about how do you, especially in existing conditions, right? How do you make sure you're protecting what's there? So again, I would I would um, agree with Randall in terms of um, infrastructure and utilities, making sure that those are safe and they are elevated so that um, and located so they are accessible to be maintained, um, that would be really important so that you're, um, you're keeping the viability of, of the existing buildings intact. Uh, I, I think some of these other mitigating strategies are also things that are good to look at in terms of accessibility, um, getting things up above flood levels so that in the future you're not having to deal with it in emergency situations. Randall, do you have any other comments to add? No, I would agree. Also, it's, you know, that's, I guess, maybe I'm a little biased because I'm from the city, but we tend to, of course, want to focus on a lot of the critical infrastructure. So the roadways, you know, in order to get, you know, people to go to where they need to go to, but also getting all the emergency vehicles and things like fire, police, and, you know, EMS, you know, that they have to have in those kind of situations, having to respond and being able to get to the location. So that's why having to elevate the critical infrastructure, whether it's the roadways and all the associated uh, utilities that are underneath the, the pavement structure, um, you know, that would probably likely be one of the uh, first steps. And then from there, then addressing the, uh, you know, the adjacent buildings and their other equipment and things that, you know, then responding to those situations to adjust because once the roadways and infrastructure is elevated, then of course, then the, uh, the adjacent properties then would adjust, um, you know, whether it's creating storage in order to handle the amount of water that likely may come into this area. Um, you know, and the same thing with the city would also have to respond by just by elevating the infrastructure, but also adjusting the things that where the water is coming from, whether it's at the outfall pipes, you know, having to put in things like, um, check valves and things like that to prevent the water from migrating up the pipes itself. You know, those are just some of the things that we would also have to respond to as well. Oh, I just thought of one, uh, another thing to add. Um, I think it, it, it is already happening, so that's, that's encouraging. I think we have to really um, continue to and try to expedite our conversations with the city and county as far as how are we implementing this from, um, a, a kind of a zoning standpoint as well. Um, I think, you know, current, our current um, guidelines are good and they've been around for a long time and there, there are reasons why they were put into place. But I think now that, you know, climate change and sea level rise is becoming so much more urgent, we need to relook at those and, and we are, but, you know, really um, bringing this to the fore and, and pivoting on what these things say about how we're managing uh, 
flood elevation heights and mainly looking at not just FEMA, but again, looking forward to sea level rise. And then also, you know, helping um, to understand really what is, what are the building height envelopes doing and how are we looking at those setbacks and all of that and throwing all of that on the table and just making sure that whatever we have in place or whatever we're, however we're amending all of this, that we are um, making it so that we're encouraging um, future buildings to um, implement a lot of these good practices um, and not causing barriers for, for people to, to want to do what's right. Thank you, Lisa. Um, to stay on time, we're going to move on to the second presentation for the second site, um, which will be uh, presented by Ireland Castillo. Next, we will be looking at three low-rise residential walk-up buildings with at-grade spaces located on the west side of Waikiki along Alawai Boulevard. These buildings were originally constructed in 1950 and are located in FEMA zone AE with a base flood elevation of six feet. Similar to site number one, I will quickly walk us through a similar approach to depicting the water levels and proposed design flood elevations for this site. Based on available data from the Honolulu Tide Station, we know that the mean higher high water level is 33 centimeters or approximately one foot one inch above local mean sea level. The present day base flood elevation is six feet above local mean sea level. Again, using the NOAA intermediate high scenario, we are designing for two feet of sea level rise relative to current mean higher high water, in addition to eight inches of additional water, which may be caused by future king tide events. Therefore, by 2050, a new sea level rise adjusted base flood elevation is proposed six feet above the water level with sea level rise and king tide. In addition, depending on the type of existing or new construction, a minimum of one or two feet of freeboard may be added on top of the SLR BFE to achieve the desired SLR adjusted design flood elevation or DFE. These SLR freeboard amounts were based on Boston's own recommendations for existing or new construction projects. At this site, we're proposing renovation for 2050 and new construction for 2100, given the current age of these buildings. By 2100, the NOAA Intermediate High scenario shows six foot eight inches of sea level rise relative to current mean higher high water, in addition, a 10 inch king tide, which will cause temporary flooding. Similarly, the base flood elevation is added to the 2100 water level and additional freeboard is added for renovation or new construction. In the following renders, we have incorporated these design flood elevations to show different adaptation strategies by 2050 and 2100. In the following renders, we will be looking at the adaptation of these typical three-story residential walk-ups. The existing residential spaces most vulnerable to flooding are those located at ground level slash at grade. These are being shown with the orange arrows. This rendering depicts two feet of sea level rise and an eight inch king tide in 2050. The existing street depicted on the left is inundated. As shown, inundation of the road may become a normal occurrence. The SLR adjusted DFE with the, is shown with the dashed black line and the building's occupied floors are shown elevated to this SLR DFE. Building adaptation strategies include elevating the entire building on structural fill as depicted by the red arrows. For example, this building in Waikiki appears to be built on top of fill with occupied floors above the surrounding grade. Our next strategy is elevating exterior circulation between the street, open space, and building via ramp or stair as highlighted in orange. Similar to this built example as shown earlier. 
Next, elevating critical systems to the appropriate SLR DFE level. This can be done by elevating the equipment on a platform or higher floor. As shown in this example for a small residential building. And lastly, incorporating below grade water storage within the new film. Such as a crate system to store water during large rainfall events. Altogether, these adaptation strategies illustrate one option for sea level rise adaptation by 2050 that is dependent on fill to keep buildings and landscape dry. In comparison, another way to envision these buildings adapting to sea level rise by 2050 allow water to flow through the site and buildings with elevated walkways and streets. First, repurposing the ground floor use for only parking, storage, or access instead of residential. Those ground floor spaces are highlighted in orange. Residential spaces would begin on the second floor above the SLR adjusted DFE in 2050. Therefore, relocation of those ground floor residential spaces could be relocated to a new fourth floor to the existing structure as shown outlined in orange. This would depend on the existing structure and allowable additional load. Moreover, the same actions to incorporate elevated exterior circulation as shown with the orange arrows shows ramps to access these buildings as well as elevating critical systems are the same. Other related building adaptation strategies include wet flood proofing the ground floor to allow the passage of water to flow in and out of the building when flooded, for example, during the 1% annual flood chance. This allows the equalization of hydrostatic forces of floodwaters on the building. Wet flood proofing of these buildings may involve installing flood vents at the perimeter walls of the building or stripping the existing structure down to its load bearing components, devoid of any non structural walls or materials. Current examples of wet flood proofing can be seen in Waikiki for below grade parking spaces along Alawai Boulevard. Additional best practices depicted is a proposal for a new green roof and cistern which would absorb rainwater runoff from the building. This combination of adaptation strategies illustrates an adaptation strategy that allows water to move through, thoroughly through the site and buildings with elevated walkways and roads. Now we'll take some time to pull the audience. Welcome back. This final rendering depicts a NOAA intermediate high scenario of six foot eight inches of sea level rise with an additional 10 inches of temporary flooding from a king tide in 2100. By the end of the century, we assume that the existing buildings, which were built in the mid 20th century, would have reached their useful end of life and a newly constructed dense mixed use development may occupy the site. You will notice that major roads such as Alawai Boulevard are raised while the surrounding area and minor streets are transformed into waterways for alternative modes of transportation, such as water taxis. Building adaptation strategies that should be incorporated in the future new construction include elevating an open foundation where water flows freely underneath the buildings. For example, current buildings in Waikiki are elevated on open foundation in addition to elevating interior circulation, as shown, the building in the foreground illustrates elevating interior circulation, which uses ramps and stairs to connect higher interior floors at the SLR adjusted DFE, as shown with the dashed line, to surrounding lower sidewalks and streets. Some examples can be seen in Waikiki and Rome. Moreover, elevating exterior circulation, the middle building illustrates ramps and stairs outside of the building, as well as elevating critical systems above the SLR adjusted DFE. And four, incorporating below grade stormwater cisterns within the new fill below the sidewalk and street. Altogether, these renderings illustrate strategies for adapting major roads, walkways, and constructing new buildings in 2100. 
Again, we'll take some time to poll the audience. Finally, one of the more important questions we had to resolve was how high should the streets be raised, given that there are currently no design standards that take into account a rising water table. In the following slides, a 2D section is used to highlight specific transportation and open space flood adaptation strategies. The existing street includes two lanes of traffic and parking on either side of the streets. By 2050, related transportation and open space strategies include, one, raising the streetscape, two, vaulting existing utilities, three, elevating critical equipment, and four, incorporating below grade water storage. In comparison to the existing street level, this proposal for a new street anticipates raising the road up to four foot four above current street elevation. The below grade crate system storms stores stormwater runoff and would be located in the new fill of the proposed street above the current water, above the water table. From the top of the water storage crate, a minimum of 24 inches made up of an eight inch asphalt, base and subgrade layers are proposed. This is based on the eco rain tank system, which is made up of multiple cells to create this type of below grade crate system. Another example without below grade water storage would still require one, raising the streetscape, two, vaulting existing utilities, and three, elevating critical equipment. In comparison to the existing street level, this proposal for a new street anticipates raising the road up to two feet above current street elevation. This incorporates the minimum, minimum of an eight inch asphalt, base, and subgrade layers on top of the existing road. Now we'll pull the audience. Next, by 2100, related transportation and open space strategies include one, raising the streetscape, two, vaulting existing utilities, three, elevating critical equipment, and four, incorporating below grade enclosed stormwater cisterns. In comparison to existing street levels, this proposal for a new street anticipates raising the road up to six foot 10 above current street elevation by 2100. Similarly, the below grade enclosed stormwater cistern system would store stormwater runoff and would be located in the new fill of the proposed street. However, it is not located above the water table. Therefore, the type of product being shown is an enclosed underground detention system, unlike the crate system shown earlier. From the top of the water storage cistern, a minimum of 24 inches made up of an eight inch asphalt, base and subgrade layer are proposed. Finally, we'll pull the audience once more. So I think we can open it up for discussion and Dolan will uh, field some of the, or ask some of the questions um, from the audience. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is before our panel. Um, a question from Daniel Chun, a really insightful question about AIA Hawaii is working on the, uh, updating building codes for sea level rise. The question is, how do we set the finished floor elevations to meet architectural standards of care given that buildings have a long service life. So this is kind of a recurring question that we see quite often. Um, how do our building codes catch up to us? So I can begin and then maybe I can explain what we did and then hand it off to Lisa and Randall. So we looked at um, what other cities are doing and I can put these two resources in the chat. They're the New York City Climate Resiliency Design Guidance and then also the Boston Coastal Flood Resilience Design Guidelines. And each of them take today's base flood elevation and add to it the projected amount of sea level rise in the year, excuse me, year that the building is being um, planned to exist until. So the um, factors of useful life, as well as the um, criticality of the building are included when trying to understand what the appropriate um, base flood or design flood elevations should be. And the um, 
in the Boston guidelines, the um, additional freeboard above the distance above the base flood elevation to establish the design flood elevation was about one foot for uh, renovations and two feet for new construction. And then I'll hand it off to Lisa. Thank you, Wendy. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and that is a very good question. And it's not an easy question to answer, I think, um, especially when you're trying to set code standards, um, because things seem to be continually changing. So if there is a, a way to be able to gauge uh, sea level rise, whether it is by, and I, it, I'm not sure how you would write this in the code, but based on um, this, when the building is being built, and then, um, like you say, Wendy, figuring out the, the life of the building and then basing that sea level rise with the amount of uh, freeboard added as part of it, or if there is a standard that's set by area. I think that is a, a very good discussion to have on it. Not an easy one, but a very good question. Randall, did you want to add anything to that or should I toss it back to Dolan? Well, I can definitely, um, although I'm not the actual person or department that's really responsible or oversees the updating of the codes, um, I do know that the city's Department of Planning and Permitting has gone through and updated a lot of their um, codes as far as the international building codes to get it up to the, I believe it's at the 2018 version. Uh, but I do know also for things uh, like these adaptation strategies, you know, like especially if it has to do with um, capturing, uh, treating and reusing a lot of water that it would also require updating the plumbing codes as well. Um, so I think that's one area that the city is looking at and, you know, especially as it relates to stormwater and climate change and sea level rise that I think going forward that those are some of the things that the city needs to do. Uh, but yeah, it's a matter of getting up to the speed of how things are changing and making sure that they're addressing all the issues that could incorporate some of these strategies into the future developments. But yeah, I know it's not something that can be done easily and it's not something that done, is done quickly, but it is something that the city should be looking at. Thanks, Randall. I'll open it up to Dolan again. Sure, yes, I'm uh, monitoring our Q&A section here and there's a number of recurring questions regarding vehicles. And so I'm gonna to try to digest this into a single question because they're, they're related to the, the elimination of underground parking in the 2050 scenario and beyond. And so stemming from that scenario, assuming that we can't park cars underground anymore, uh, there's a number of questions about, should we be reconsidering um, the role and function of vehicles in a place like Waikiki and what does the future of Waikiki hold with respect to vehicles? So I know that's kind of a loaded question, but we can open it up for some discussion there. Uh, but more specifically, um, what does the future of parking and vehicle use look like in a low elevation place like Waikiki? Uh, I guess I'll chime in to start, uh, but transportation is is a very important part of it. And I know in this in this exercise, it was looking at two specific sites. So I think the next step would be then to go further out and beyond um, just the site itself. And how does it affect the entire community or the entire neighborhood that we're looking at? And transportation is definitely an important part of that. Um, I know in some of your solutions you had where the parking then, um, depending on the building and if it's an existing building to be retrofitted, sometimes that parking can then be uh, transferred to that next level up. Um, I think those serious conversations have to be had on, on the transportation um, flow and whether or not cars are you know, allowed or, or if there's limitations on that and how we look at the streetscape and um, how we become more of a multimodal type of uh, system in the city. Yeah, I'll just maybe um, concur with what um, Lisa mentioned is, you know, it, it seems like the direction is that, you know, sort of getting away from having to be so tied to your personal vehicles. Um, and maybe it is changing some of that mentality and in that sense to just not 
the only mode of transportation, but using multiple modes of transportation, I think is the focus. And I believe that the city is, uh, you know, has been doing a lot of those type of um, efforts to make it more accessible and providing other opportunities to get to your places of where you need to get to, um, to other modes of transportation. Thank you. I think a, a good point brought up in the Q&A also had to do with when considering retrofitting a building, uh, many of the buildings may not have been designed originally to withstand saltwater inundation temporarily or even permanently. Um, this brings up questions about the material integrity and structural reinforcement. Um, can you, Lisa and Randall, talk a little bit about the factors that one might consider when tackling a potential retrofit? Yeah, um, you know, when we're looking at buildings and we think about sustainability too, it, it, you know, what we always say is, you know, the most sustainable building is an existing one. So you really want to look at ways if, if you can retrofit, uh, but, you know, there has to be an assessment in terms of feasibility. So, you know, Hale's point about can the foundations, can the structure, can finishes really withstand um, salt water and sea level rise or not? Those are questions we need to ask. If, if we're looking at maybe retrofitting and adding a floor to a building that might help. Then you have to look at the foundations, right? The integrity and the capability and the capacity of foundations. Um, is the first floor able to be adapted? Does it have a high enough ceiling where you might be able to you know, um, raise the floor? Can the entire building be raised? Well, that depends again on the structure. So all of those um, things need to be assessed in terms of is it is it feasible? And if it is, great, we can move ahead that way. But if not, then we may have to look at um, alternative measures. Yeah, that would be the same thing from, from an engineering standpoint. I'm sure that they would have to look at the, the different type of loadings because of course, not expecting that it would be submerged in those kind of conditions where now it's holding that additional load of water that's coming with the ebb and flow, um, but also becoming a storage area so, you know, making sure that the foundations are able to support it, but also whatever the type of construction uh, materials and methods that was used during that time would determine if, you know, are those critical foundations and the, the you know, the containment walls, whatever the load bearing walls are able to support that amount of loads, but also is it something that it's been subjected to exposure to those type of sea level um, conditions where the reinforcement likely may be compromised um, and having to then adjust and you know hardening those structures and providing additional um, you know that coverage so that the uh, the reinforcement is not subjected to corrosion and being able to now um, you know affecting the capacity and ability to handle that amount of loads and you know i was kind of peeking at some of the comments and um Brad mentioned something that's also very important. Um, and I know, again, this presentation was focusing in on two specific sites, but then again, the next step would be looking beyond the sites and making sure that whatever is being done um, is, isn't going to negatively impact any adjacent sites, any surrounding areas, um, and that it's all looked at as a whole so that we're not causing an additional problem uh, with adjacencies and, and uh, other properties as well, as, as you know, we're planning for um, for solving all of these issues. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Randall. So I know we're edging up to the end of our session. First, I'll just let you know, a glimpse into our next steps. Um, so we were looking at two sites to begin with. We're going to continue this design research with two new graduate research assistants and staff looking at a beachfront building and open space. and. Um, we also want to offer our contact information, so you're welcome to email us um, at the Sea Grant Center for Smart Building and Community Design. And if you'd like to learn more about the sea level rise adaptation strategies posted, please visit the website. We have videos, slides, and an extensive feedback report from a 2021 stakeholder workshop where we've recorded comments on the flood adaptation strategies and their feasibility. Um, and in addition, we'll um, post the slides and video from today, and we'll also try to answer the questions that we didn't get to. Um, thank you all for your great questions. 
Um, we very much appreciate your participation today. A special mahalo to our guest panelists, uh, audience, presenters, organizers, and funding agencies. Thank you for sharing your progressive thoughts on adapting our coastal communities to sea level rise. Thanks and have a great day. Aloha.